Hi everyone and welcome to the next video in the series on Bobby Fischer's My 60 Memorable Games. A few people were saying they'd like to see one of the losses from the book, which contains three, so this time I thought we'd have a look at his game played against Boris Spassky at the Mar del Plata tournament in Argentina in 1960. They were both young stars at the time, although Spassky was older, age 23, whereas Fischer was just 17. It was also the first time they'd ever played in competition. The game is entitled Old Wine in a New Bottle, and Larry Evans gives the introduction as follows. Here is the second of the three losses contained in this volume. As in the previous example, Fisher misses a win by inches. Deviating from his cherished Sicilian, he enables Spassky to employ the King's Gambit, not quite believing he would. Spassky is one of the few grandmasters who still does so in competition. NB, this was written 40 years ago now. The King's Gambit these days has virtually disappeared from top level play. Larry Evans continues, Fisher promptly wins a pawn and hangs on to it, but neglects to steer for a highly favourable ending. To get into the game anyway, Spassky had the white pieces and opened with e4. And as Larry Evans indicated in the introduction, Fisher elected to answer symmetrically with e5, which was very unusual for him. Over the course of his entire career, he met e4 with e5 in less than 5% of his games with the black pieces, preferring, as I'm sure you know, the Sicilian defense. So Spassky went into the King's Gambit with f4 which is one of the oldest openings in chess at roughly 500 years old. It was really popular up until about 100 years ago, and especially in the days of Paul Morphy and the era of romantic chess, where attack and sacrifice was everything. Steinitz was one of the first players to introduce quieter and more positional play, which he proved to be superior, and a school of thought that evolved as a result largely rejected the soundness of the King's Gambit overall because it's generally possible for White to maintain a safe advantage with careful play in the opening. Regardless of that, some players, myself included, still like to play it as it can lead to wild and highly tactical situations quite easily. For the Gambit pawn, White gets a strong pawn centre and a dangerous open f-file to work with and if black wants to hold on to the pawn, theory has shown that he must create significant weaknesses in his defence. Fischer accepted the pawn with e takes f4, and Spassky played the king's knight variation with knight f3, which is good because it stops the annoying queen h4 check. Fischer continued with one of the main lines, g5, and of this move he writes, This loss spurned me to look for a refutation of the King's Gambit, which I published in the American Chess Quarterly, Volume 1, 1961. His analysis was extensive and interesting, and I'll make a separate video about it after this one. At this stage, instead of g5, he gives the best move as d6, which is now known as the Fisher defense to the King's Gambit. So g5 is what he played in this game anyway, and Spassky continued with h4, which is the Paris attack which Fisher writes is the only realistic try for any advantage for White and he goes on to say that there is no longer anything romantic about the Muzio Gambit which has been analyzed to a draw and that that line goes Bishop C4 G4 and now White gambits a knight by castling because after G takes F3 Queen takes F3 he'll have three pieces bearing down on F7 when Black loses his f-pawn, which is now unavoidable. However, as Fisher said, after queen f6, the best that white can hope for is a draw. It's been extensively analyzed. But anyway, back to the game continuation. h4 is what Spassky played. Now came g4 and knight e5, the Kieseritsky variation of the king's gambit, which is named after the Estonian 19th century master, Lionel Kieseritsky. Play continued with knight f6. If instead h5 in order to defend the g-pawn from the knight, now white has a bishop c4 bearing down on f7 and threatening to win the exchange with knight takes f7. Best play here goes rook h7 in order to defend and now d4, d6, knight d3, f3, 
g takes f3, bishop e7, bishop e3, bishop takes h4 check, king d2, bishop g5, f4, bishop h6, knight c3, where white has more than enough compensation for the pawn. And Fisher adds that this is vintage analysis, you know, it's, as it's one of the oldest openings, it's been absolutely analyzed to death, you could say, and um, so it is very reliable analysis. And although black has connected past pawns here, white is miles ahead in development and his center is very powerful here. But anyway, back to the game continuation. Knight f6 is what Fisher played. And then came d4. So supporting the knight and gaining the ideal pawn center. And Fisher gave the analysis for a couple of alternative lines here. The first one goes bishop c4, where best play continues d5 to uh, nullify that threat on f7, and after e takes d5, bishop g7, which Fisher calls the modern panacea or cure all. Um, playing instead bishop d6 is an older move and also adequate in order to defend. Another alternative at move 6 instead of d4 is knight takes g4. But now black has knight takes e4, now to d3, knight g3, bishop takes f4, and knight takes h1, and queen e2 check. If instead bishop g5, then bishop e7, queen e2. And best play goes h5, and queen e5, attacking the rook. And now the unexpected continuation, f6, where after knight takes f6, black has king f7, which is the analysis of Steinitz, for whom Fischer had great respect. And Fritz agrees that black is easily winning in this position, nearly four pawns ahead overall. So, queen e2 check is the correct move. And now queen e7 is the only decent defense for black. And he's still better after knight f6 check, king d8, and now a combination to win the black queen with bishop takes c7 check, forcing king takes c7, and now knight d5 check, king d8, knight takes e7, and bishop takes e7, which is a line that was played between Morphy and Anderson in Paris in 1858 and analyzed in depth to show that black should win. Again, Fritz agrees with an evaluation of black being ahead, objectively speaking, by just over a pawn. But anyway, back to the game continuation. d4 is what Spassky played here. And Fischer continued with d6, and then came knight d3, and knight takes e4, which is wrecking white's strong pawn center at the cost of development, but we're still well within the book lines here. Play continued with bishop takes f4, bishop g7, and knight c3, which Fischer gave a question mark, noting that after this move, white has no compensation for the sacrifice pawn. And he gives the alternative c3, where one line goes queen e7, queen e2, and bishop f5, where, in Fischer's words, at least white keeps a grip on f4 for what it's worth. So knight c3, anyway. Then came knight takes c3, b takes c3, and c5. The last book move of the game, with black immediately nibbling at white center. Paul Keres was of the opinion that it was better for black to castle before playing this move. Fisher, however, thrived on activity and initiative, and he was unconcerned about queen e2 check, because bishop e6 is fine as a defense. If d5, naively hoping to win the bishop, black has bishop takes c3 check with a winning advantage. So, bishop e2 is what Spassky played, and then came c takes d4, and now Spassky castled. If instead bishop takes g4, then knight c6 with a big edge to black. So castles, and knight c6. And Fisher adds that it doesn't pay to be greedy here and play instead h5, hoping to hold on to the g-pawn, because after bishop g5, f6 is the best move. Now bishop c1 with knight f4 coming next, and black's kingside 
is all messed up. The scope of his bishop is ruined and his defense is just full of holes here on the king's side. Um, and that, that would just be diabolical for black. Okay, that's the end of part one.